NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, how is everyone tonight? Oh, good. Thank you so much for coming out to join us on this relatively soggy California evening. <laughs> so shall we? Planets orbiting other stars, or exoplanets, have become an important field of astronomical study over the past 25 years. Recent findings from NASA's Kepler mission suggest that nearly every star you see in the night sky probably has exoplanets orbiting it. The number of confirmed exoplanets is now a few thousand and their discoveries have yielded terms that would have sounded alien to astronomers before the 1990s. Hot Jupiters, pulsar planets, super-Earths, mini-Neptunes, and circumbinary planets. Now, trends are emerging amongst exoplanet populations, which put our own solar system in context, noting most exoplanetary systems appear to be very unlike our own. Tonight's guest will present a brief history of exoplanet discoveries the story of the transiting super Saturn extrasolar ring system, and summarize NASA's ongoing and future plans to discover and characterize strange new worlds. Tonight's guest has been the Deputy Program Chief Scientist of the NASA Exoplanet Exploration Program since August of 2016. His research interests focus on astronomical observations related to the formation and evolution of planetary systems and stars, and in particular, their ages. He graduated with a B.S. in astronomy and astrophysics and physics from Penn State in 1998, a master's degree in physics from the University of New South Wales Australian Defence Force Academy, while a Fulbright Fellow in 1999, and he received his Ph.D. in astronomy from the University of Arizona in 2004. After his Ph.D., he was a Clay Postdoctoral Fellow at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. More recently, he was a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Rochester and a staff astronomer at the Cerro Tololo Observatory in Chile. He has also been part of several astronomical discoveries over the years, including the discovery of the first transiting extrasolar ring system, the nearest historical flyby of a star to the solar system, and the discoveries of low-mass stellar companions to the bright stars Alcor, Fomalhaut, and Canopus. He has discovered several nearby star clusters within hundreds of light years distance to the sun, and recently he was co-discoverer of a comet. He is an active member of the International Astronomical Union, and he is currently the chair of the newly formed IAU Working Group on Star Names. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome tonight's guest, Dr. Eric Mamajak. Thank you. It's absolutely wonderful to be here. I, as uh, he mentioned, I just got to JPL in August, so I'm relatively new to California, so apparently things are wetter than where I came from. We now inhabit a water world uh, in Southern California. So I'm going to tell you about exoplanets, a quest for strange new worlds. Um, this is a topic that's obviously near and dear to my heart, so I'm, uh, the first part of the talk will be a little bit personal to me because this uh, as the discoveries have sort of unfolded over the last few decades, um, they, uh, they sort of fed into my interest uh, in, in astronomy. So I've been sort of watching this field since uh, elementary school. Um, so this is one of my favorite places on Earth. This is actually Saratola Observatory in Chile. And this is a few of the domes there. Um, if you go out uh, at night when the moon is not up, um, if there's some low cloud that's blocking out uh, some of the lights from a few of the small towns nearby and the mines, you get a really, really, really dark sky. Um, it's so dark, as you're walking around, you can see your shadow on the domes. And that shadow is not from the sun, it's not from the moon, it's from the stars. There's nothing else illuminating the sky. You only have to go outside, dark adapted for a few minutes, and you start seeing this effect. It is literally the light, the integrated light from billions of stars in the galaxy that's projecting um, uh, the light that's producing your shadow. This was a uh, really neat place to, to, uh, to work, and uh, so every once in a while when you're observing, you can take a little break and, and walk outside and see the stars. And on a typical, uh, uh, outside of light pollution, <laughs> 
you should be able to see hundreds or thousands of stars in the, in the night sky. We've got something like a few hundred billion stars in our galaxy. There's probably hundreds of billions of galaxies in our, in our universe. Um, and so you wonder, are there other planets out there? Okay. So this is, uh, you're seeing on the left what our galaxy looks like from Earth. You see lots of stars. You see these inky dark regions among the stars. Those are, those are dark molecular clouds, and as I'll tell you later, that's actually where stars are forming in, in those clouds. We now, astronomers over the last several decades, have been able to measure the distances to stars more precisely. We can measure the distances to these clouds more precisely, and we can sort of deproject the edge on Milky Way into uh, uh, the, the, the Milky Way's actual appearance. Now, this is an artist's conception, but a really good artist's conception. Um, it's most of the stuff we have mapped out is just in this little quadrant down here within a couple hundred uh, or a couple of thousand light years of the, of the sun. Our sun would be a completely uh, imperceptible dot right here between two spiral arms, okay? So the galactic bulge is here. It's about 30,000 light years away. And our sun is moving around the galaxy at about 200 kilometers per second. You don't feel it. So we'd like to know, are there, are there other planets uh, out there? This is the, uh, the preface to a great book that came out a few years ago by Sarah Seeger, who's a regular visitor to JPL and a professor at MIT. Uh, she uh, edited this book called Exoplanets, and she wrote, this is a unique time in human history. For the first time, we're on the technological brink of being able to answer questions that have been around for thousands of years. Are there other planets like Earth? Are they common? Do they have signs of life? These are really big questions, and we're sort of slowly unveiling uh, the curtain and finding these answers, and we're sort of in a lucky generation to be able to see this uh, uh, unfurl. So this is me, about 1980. Um, I grew up on a horse farm in southwestern Pennsylvania. The skies were moderately dark. Uh, very quickly, I was interested in uh, things like geology and meteorology. I saw Mount St. Helens a year after it blew up. I thought, this is crazy. How could the earth, you know, how could a mountain explode? We didn't have those in Pennsylvania. We had coal, limestone. It didn't explode. Uh, but it got you thinking about the universe and, and physics and chemistry and, uh, and how the universe works. And it didn't take long until I was interested in astronomy. But this also coincided with pictures like this. I remember being five or six years old and seeing the pictures of this ringed planet and wondering what that was. And for a short time, I thought that must have been Earth. I thought I lived on the ringed planet. And I was like, well, I can't see the ring at night. But you, I saw this, this, these uh, pictures of Saturn so often that uh, uh, it, it made you wonder. And uh, so I was sort of a, vo a, a, a child of the Voyager era in the 1980s. Uh, you know, every few years, there was all these great pictures uh, uh, coming from NASA from these robotic uh, space probes that were sent to the outer solar system. Uh, the people in the auditorium are sitting next to a model of one right here. Um, and the two probes I'm talking about, of course, are Voyager 1 and, and Voyager 2. And they completed the first reconnaissance of the outer solar system. Voyager 2 made it past all four of the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And these are really interesting uh, worlds in themselves. Here's, the, here's a picture of Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Uh, the Voyagers are now over 100 astronomical units away from the sun, 100 times the, the Earth's sun distance. They're reaching the area where the sun's wispy atmosphere of ionized gas is sort of melting into uh, the gas from the rest of the galaxy. They've effectively left the solar system. They haven't left the, the sun's gravity, but they've, uh, they've, they've effectively left the, uh, the solar system. So Voyager was launched in 1977. And I knew even in elementary school there was this interesting place called JPL, and there was these interesting people at a place called, uh, you know, that worked for an entity called NASA. And they were explorers. And they, were, they wanted to study the universe and study planets. And this sounded like a really, really uh, neat uh, job. And there was, it was an exciting time. Uh, the last few decades have been very exciting. There's been a lot of very interesting discoveries. And it's fun to be here at JPL and actually give a talk on this. This is sort of our classic cartoon picture of the solar system uh, with the now eight classic planets. And we were sort of taught in the 1980s that uh, we have these small, rocky planets on the interior. There's Earth, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And the small, rocky planets form on the inner part of the solar system. And then all of a sudden, out past about two, three times the, the Earth's sun distance, you start getting these worlds that are dominated by the ices, things like water and ammonia and methane. They're the so-called astronomical ices, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen with, with hydrogens attached. 
and uh, also a lot of hydrogen and helium. Jupiter and Saturn were very much dominated by hydrogen and helium. And each of them had their own little system of moons. All the moons were interesting, these small cratered worlds. Some of them had active geology. A couple of them have atmospheres. Um, and uh, so the, this was sort of our, our classic picture of the solar system uh, through about the 1980s. Uh, shortly after they were finding the, uh, there was discovery of the, the Kuiper Belt out past uh, Pluto. We now know there's, there's icy worlds out there. And there may even be another planet, so-called Planet Nine. It would not surprise me if that was discovered in the next year or two. The dynamical evidence looks pretty interesting. So one of the great, uh, I would say, victories of physics and astronomical, uh, of, of astronomy in the 20th century is this sort of comprehensive picture of the formation, the evolution, and death of stars. We understand stellar structure very well, the stellar atmospheres. Um, if you could sort of stand back and look at our galaxy over a time scale of millions of years, billions of years, you would see stars being formed, living their lives, and being snuffed out through various means. And this is just showing the, the, the evolutionary pathways for uh, small stars like the sun. They're born in these dark molecular clouds. I'll talk about these a little bit more later. They collapse. Basically, this is why do stars form? Stars are forming in the gas and dust in the, uh, floating around the galaxy. It's where gravity wins out over gas pressure and magnetic field pressure. It's a very inefficient process. Okay, Only a few percent of the mass in these clouds actually form stars, and then only a tiny fraction of the mass that goes into forming uh, the star will end up forming the planets. So our sun will live a nice, happy life for about 10 billion years. We're about halfway through. At the end of its life, it'll become a red giant. It'll exhaust its hydrogen fuel, and it'll furiously change its inner structure to try to heat to higher temperatures to, uh, to, to, to burn other f sources of fuel. It'll run out, and eventually it'll turn into a planetary nebula. It'll blow off its outer layers. So this is going on. This, this, this whole time scale here is about 12 billion years. And for, uh, for low-mass stars in the galaxy, stars even down to the mass of the sun, some of them have had time to go through this cycle. The massive stars, the big, bright, white, blue, blue-white stars you see in the night sky, um, those live very short lives. These are stars that are typically 10 or tens of times the mass of the sun. They correspondingly live very short lives, maybe tens of millions of years. And they go through a much more destructive phase at the end. They actually explode. And depending on their mass, they'll turn into either a neutron star or, or a black hole. But what doesn't go into the neutron star and black hole contains a lot of metals and a lot of stuff that turns into planets and turns into life. And this process is constantly enriching the gas in our galaxy. Our galaxy is slowly getting full of so-called metals. So here's the periodic table of elements you're used to seeing that you learned in your chemistry class. Most of the normal uh, uh, gas in the, in the galaxy is hydrogen and helium up here, elements number one and number two. They're about 98% of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the amount of normal matter in the galaxy. We're excluding so-called dark matter and dark energy. That's for another talk. All the rest of the other elements are less than 2%, okay, if you averaged out over the galaxy. But those are pretty important because they end up turning into planets and turning into life. Now, the astronomers, this is the astronomers' HR diagram. Hydrogen, helium, metals. Okay, all the other 90 plus, I think we're up to 118, but most of those are short-lived. But the other 90 or so stable elements, uh, the astronomers just call them metals. And they, they tend to track each other in terms of their relative abundance with respect to each other. So we talk about the metallicity of stars and the metallicity of the galaxy. And the amount of metals in the galaxy is sl slowly getting higher over time because stars are living in and dying. And they're returning this, uh, um, uh, the products of the uh, nucleosynthesis and the stellar cores, returning it to the galaxy. Now what happens to that stuff? There's all of our metals. Well, here's a typical nearby nebula. This is the Orion Nebula. Um, this is a, a very beautiful nebula about 1,000 light years away. There's a few thousand stars that are forming in this gas. And so what we're seeing is baby stars less than about a million years old that are condensing out of this gas. And the very most massive ones are, have already turned on. They're already burning their hydrogen. They're giving off a ton of ultraviolet radiation, and they're blowing away the gas. Those high-mass stars are actually de destroying the nest that the stars are forming out of. Well, if you zoom in on that nebula, here's some Hubble Space Telescope images. And this is amazing. What you're seeing is baby pictures of suns. These are all little stars forming. And you'll notice, if you zoom in, they look like little blobs. And we know the distance to Orion, and we can measure the angle that, uh, that covers these little blobs. And the, answer, the, the size of these blobs is only on the order of a few hundred times 
uh, the Earth-Sun distance, okay? So the, um, they're, we're talking about solar system scales here, okay? So these are so-called proplids or protoplanetary disks, and they're fascinating. You can see uh, some of these look very dark. What you're seeing is this illuminated nebula behind it, and the gas and dust that's forming in planets around these little stars is actually blocking out the light behind it. There's hundreds of these. This is one star formation region in our galaxy. This is the Orion Nebula. There's thousands of them. Okay, this is going on right now. So star formation is going on. There's supernovae. There's, we see planetary nebula. We see, the, we see evidence of stellar death. So there's this sort of uh, birth and death of stars going on. And we see, during stellar birth, we see the ingredients for forming planets. Okay, so that's great. We've seen some uh, disks around baby stars. We know that there's metals there. There's material for forming planets, uh, including things you'll find in your vitamins and in your food that life likes. So how do we discover and characterize planets? Why are they so hard to find? Why did it take until only a couple decades ago to find planets? Well, a few of the first hints were actually um, uh, teased out here in the, in the 1980s. This is a satellite called IRAS that was launched in 1983 from Vandenberg. This satellite did an infrared all-sky survey, and it found a few surprises. So one of the things it found was that a handful of the nearby stars actually had big infrared excesses. These stars were giving off way more infrared light than they should be, okay? So we know what the, the, the distribution of energies are for, for stars and, and how much light they should give out in the infrared. There was a certain class of stars that was giving off way more infrared light, and it was actually a group uh, uh, here at, at uh, JPL in, in 1984 and at University of Arizona, uh, there was this great paper by uh, Smith and, and Richard Terrell, uh, Brad Smith and Richard Terrell, and they actually went to a telescope in Chile, and they decided to look at one of these stars with a chronograph. They blotted out the light from the star, and they took a deep image of it. And lo and behold, they saw this stuff on both sides of the stars, okay? This is actually, uh, this is what was responsible for the infrared light, but this is ground up dust grains orbiting this star, Beta Pictoris, which we now know is pretty young as a star. It's about 20 or 25 million years old. Um, and this was sort of, this is one of our first hints that there was planets there, because if you see this dust, it should get blown out by the star's light in a very short time, maybe hundreds of thousands to millions of years. So there had to be some population of things grinding up, asteroids, comets, et cetera, that were creating, that were kicking up this dust. So this ended up being actually a nearby uh, uh, baby solar system. So things were starting to get interesting. I remember seeing this story when I was in elementary school, and that really uh, it sort of made it clear that we were, we were kind of getting to the point where we we're going to start finding these planets soon. So how do we find planets? Okay. Well, you think you could just take an image, right? You take your telescope, you look at the star. If you squint hard enough, you may see a little dim dot next to the star. This is really tricky, okay? There's a, there's a few complications. One is the, st the planets themselves are only, a planet like Jupiter is only about one billionth as bright as its star, okay? This is in the reflected light. So that planet is, the star is giving off light, the light's hitting that planet, and then that light's being redirected to us. And uh, the ratio is about one in a billion. It's, it's even fainter for uh, a, sun, uh, a planet like Earth. Well, this is very challenging. The other problem is the planets tend to be, if they're on the same scale as our solar system, if there's several astronomical units, the stars are so far away that the angular separation is very, very tiny. So the star is right up against the, the uh, sorry, the planet is right up against the star. And so you actually need to, you need to, you need to do something to the star's light. Because the other problem is, we're on Earth, we're at the bottom of an atmosphere, and that atmosphere plays with the light, right? The stars twinkle. The stars are twinkling because there's these little variations in the temperature and the humidity of the air, and the light waves that are going through the atmosphere wiggle around a little bit. And so they blur out the star's light, and they'll completely swamp the poor planet. So you can't just go to the telescope, look through it, and say, oh, I see a planet next to the star. You actually have to blot out the, um, the star's light, or there's a few other tricks I'll show you later, okay? So this is so-called direct imaging. Um, one, of the, one of the ways to find planets that's been very popular for decades and still has, unfortunately, uh, it still shows promise but has not borne much fruit, I'll put it that way, is so-called astrometry. And that is looking for the wobbles of a star due to a planet tugging on it, okay? So the planet itself is pulling gravitationally on the star. We think of the planets orbiting the sun and the sun is at the center of the solar system. That's not quite true. There's something called the barycenter. Um, Jupiter is the big um, 
uh, uh, source of gravity that's tugging on the sun, and the sun actually uh, moves around the inner solar system a little bit on the time scale similar to Jup Jupiter's orbit. It's pretty gradual. It's on the order of hundreds of kilometers, hundreds of thousands of kilometers. But it's something, if you're far enough away, if you measure the position of the star accurately enough, you should be able to tease out that signal. But it's very tough. So this is just showing how you would use multiple stars. If you could actually accurately measure the angle between the star with the planet and these other stars, over time, you might be able to see the little bumps and wiggles of the star's position and tease out the planet. This is the, uh, one of the first techniques that ended up being very fruitful. This is so-called Doppler spectroscopy, or the radial velocity method. So what are we doing? So you've got your planet orbiting the star. It's tugging on the star. The star is moving around. And as it's moving around, its velocity is changing. It's moving towards you. It's moving away from you. Okay. So the light is being Doppler shifted. It'll be blue shifted if it's moving away from you. It's red shifted if it's moving away from us. Now, the planet is not that massive compared to the star. It's a very, very subtle signal. Okay? If we're talking about Jupiter pulling on the sun, we're talking about a 12 meter per second signal over 12 years. Okay? 12 meters per second is about as fast as Usain Bolt goes in 10 seconds. Okay? Um, very slow. If we're talking an Earth-like planet, we're talking about 10 centimeters per second, which is how I would run next to Usain Bolt. Okay? Very, very slow signal. Okay? So this is just sort of generalizing. We don't see the colors changing red and blue. When the things are moving near the speed of light, you actually see a color shift. We see that with uh, quasars. But this is a very subtle signal. You're looking, for, you're looking at the spectrum of the star, and the lines are moving back and forth very, very tiny amounts. So this is the so-called Doppler spectroscopy technique, and there's been many hundreds of planets found through this technique. The technique that's been very fruitful for the last decade and a half is the so-called transit method. Okay? This is what happens when a planet passes in front of its star. Now the trick is you need to measure how bright the star is very accurately. Okay? So here's time. Here's how bright the star is. Uh, if we've got a star like the sun, over time it, it only varies at about the one part in a thousand level over a long time. You might see some star spots appear here and there that make some little dips. But if you have a Jupiter-sized planet pass in front of the sun, you'd get a dip of about 1%. Okay, now we're talking. We can measure 1% dip for a lot of the brightest stars. If you get a planet like the Earth, which is another factor of 10 smaller than Jupiter, and its area is another factor of 100 smaller, we're looking for a signal that's one part in 10,000. Hmm, okay, that's getting tough. It's very difficult to do from the ground. It's difficult to measure the brightnesses of the stars that accurately from the ground. But if you go to space, voila, now we're talking about discovering Earth-like planets. So I'll talk about the Kepler mission here in a bit. The Kepler mission has been responsible for finding most of the planets that have been discovered now. We're talking thousands of planets. So this is a great technique. This is just another movie showing differences in the sizes. So if you had a, a large planet, let's say a Jupiter-sized planet and an Earth-sized planet, you'll, just get, you'll get different uh, uh, depths in the, uh, in the light curve. Okay? So you get roughly 1% signals for a Jupiter-like planet and about a 1 part in 10,000 signal for an Earth-like planet. Now, uh, the other thing Kepler has been finding is multiple planet systems, okay? There's actually been systems seen now. We, we, we have uh, a great vantage point. We happen to see multiple planets passing in front of the star. And if you're really lucky, you start to see gravitational perturbations. The planets are pulling on each other, and we can measure, actually measure those masses. I'll show a plot later in this talk uh, exploiting that te technique to measure some masses. So Kepler has found some very interesting multi-planet systems, and there's... Um, uh, these have been very interesting because it, it's easier to get the masses of those planets. This is another technique called microlensing. This has been uh, 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 put to good use over about the last decade, and it's now going to be a, a primary means of finding planets uh, for uh, one of the means of finding planets for the, for the upcoming WFIRST mission. So you have your telescope down here, and let's say you have a background star, but something passes in front of it. Let's say some mass, let's say a star or a planet. As it passes in front, the, the space-time is curved, okay? Light is not following straight lines. You think a light beam is going to follow a straight line. The light is following a straight line in four dimensions. Oh, God, here we go. We're going into Einstein. Um, what, from our perspective, is our three-dimensional beings passing through time, from our perspective, that straight line looks curved. And, and the mass actually acts like a lens. You actually get the light from the star bend around that mass and focus and what you get is an enhancement in the amount of light. So this is time, and then this is the brightness of the star. So you'll get these characteristic curves, 
And if this thing that's passing in front has a planet, you get an extra little curve on top of it, okay? So you may get this curve, and then you get another little one, and this technique so far has been uh, sensitive to very small planets. We're talking things down uh, well below the, the size of Earth. Now, the trick is, this doesn't happen all the time. You need these two stars to line up. So you need to look at many, many, many thousands of stars, or millions of stars. And so W first is going to be surveying the center of our galaxy. I showed you that picture at the beginning of, our, of our, the center of our galaxy, some of the richest star fields in the galaxy. And then if you start looking at a lot of these statistically, uh, st uh, statistically you'll start picking these, these events up. So uh, I showed you that the, the, there was the detection of that dust around Beta Pictoris in 1983 with the IRAS satellite. Things started to get interesting around 1989. This is the star HD 114762. These are our lovely stellar designations. Okay, stellar designations are the phone number names. Um, this was a giant planet orbiting in about uh, 80 days, roughly at the, about the same distance Mercury is from its star, but this planet is about 11 times bigger than Jupiter. We don't know the inclination of this system. We don't know how tilted it is because it didn't pass in front of its star. But around 1989, uh, this star would start, was being used as a standard uh, when they were measuring the velocities of other stars. They kept coming back to this one. As a, as a useful ruler of how fast the star was moving. And they noticed that this, this standard star itself was moving at the hundreds of meters a second level. So there was this nice paper by Dave Blatham from Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. And they said, well, this could be a failed star. It could be a planet. And back in these days, it was a little voodoo to start saying you, you uh, detected a, a planet. Um, but as we look back now, this could be the first planet that was actually detected. This, this one is real. Things got really interesting around 1992. This was 25 years ago this week, hard to believe. January 1992, there was the discovery of uh, three planets around a pulsar. So what's a pulsar? This is the remnant of a massive star that's undergone a supernova, and all that's left is this huge uh, mass about the, size of our, about the mass of our sun, but packed into about 10 kilometers, okay? So roughly the, 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 the size of Pasadena, but with as much mass as our sun, okay? It'd be, it would be, not be a very nice place to live, okay? The whole thing is made of neutrons, okay? There's so much, um, uh, there's so much pressure there, the protons and, and electrons themselves have actually fused into, into neutrons. So it's essentially a gigantic nucleus. Well, it has a huge magnetic field, and it spins rapidly, and it gives off these radio waves, and those radio waves can be picked up by astronomers on Earth. And lo and behold, this new pulsar called B1257 plus 12, also known as LIC now, it has a new IAU name, um, this object was moving back and forth. The timing of the radio signals was changing, and it was fairly complex because, lo and behold, it was three bodies pulling on it. So these two outer ones, would, and I can't, I can't remember the original letter. The original, there's letter designations, uh, B, C, D for these. I like them. There's the new IU names. These are easier to remember now. Poltergeist and Dragar, these two are about three times the mass of the Earth. Phobator is very small. It's, it's uh, on the order of the size of Mercury or so. So these were very tiny planets. There was no other effect they could think of that could replicate this, this, uh, uh, this variation in the pulsar signal. So this was really the first rock-solid evidence, I would say, of, of extrasolar planets. Um, and again, that was 25 years ago this week. Around 1995, um, the, uh, things got interesting again. This was the discovery of 51 Peg B. Um, this was a hot Jupiter. This was a very unexpected signal. There was the 51 Peg is a very sun-like star. It's a yellow main sequence star like the sun, um, sort of middle-aged. And lo and behold, the, the uh, star was moving back and forth at about the 100 meter per second level in its orbit. And what you need to do, uh, what you need to explain that is, is a half Jupiter mass planet on a four-day period. Okay, nobody was expecting this before 1995. Because, as you saw from our solar system, we had an example of one solar system. We don't have any giant planets within a few astronomical units of the sun. There, you need ices to form those. Um, so why would you have a giant planet so close? And, uh, but it was, it was there, and it was quickly confirmed by another, uh, uh, another group in, in California. So right away, we were starting to see some very strange objects. Okay? H, the, the first one I showed you was 10 Jupiter masses. This was really... Uh, pushing the boundaries of what you might consider a planet. The second example was planets around a dead star, a pulsar, pulsar planets. And then the next, next example was a Jupiter orbiting its star in a few days. Okay, we're nowhere near finding anything like our solar system yet by 1995. Um, I'm going to skip a lot of history, which is going to make a lot of exoplanet astronomers mad. I am apologize if you have left off your planets. There's a few thousand of them now, and all your missions and all your telescopes. So we're going to skip through to what I think is a few interesting cases here. 
Um, and just to, just to, just to uh, show you some, some interesting um, uh, examples. So the, uh, the Kepler mission launched in 2009. I'll show you a few plots from, from that mission. And one of the surprises was a circumbinary planet. Okay, can a planet actually form out here, uh, uh, outs uh, outside the, 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 uh, the orbits uh, of its stars? And the answer seems to be yes. Um, and they're finding uh, many examples of these. And they're roughly, they, they tend to be on the order of a factor of five further away than the separations between the two stars. As we look at young stars, we do see examples of pairs of young stars that actually have a disk of material orbiting both. We, we see circumbinary disks of gas and dust that probably form these planets. So um, I'll be the first astronomer who's given one of these talks that does not mention uh, a certain movie about a certain person that was bullseyeing womp rats on their desert planet that had two stars. I'm not going to mention it. Uh, Kepler also found, has found so far, uh, uh, small rocky planets in the habitable zones of their stars. So what do we mean by habitable zone? Uh, you could start many an argument uh, defining exactly what the, what the habitable zone means. Um, it's the range of orbital separations orbiting a star where you could plausibly have liquid water on the surface of the planet. Liquid water seems to be the main um, uh, environmental constraint um, uh, for life, at least on our planet. You need water. And so uh, if you move a planet too close, if you, if you took Earth and you moved a bit closer to the sun, you would initiate a runaway greenhouse effect. You'd actually boil off the oceans. If you move the Earth too far away, the Earth starts to get very cold. You actually start freezing out carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere, and you start forming clouds that act like a big mirror, and you get a runaway, which actually makes the planet colder. So there's sort of a, a, a narrow range of orbital separations where a planet can have uh, uh, liquid water, and so this is just a little gallery of the planets so far out of the 2,000 plus that Kepler has found that happen to be in the habitable zones of their stars. These are the different types of stars. M stars, these are the so-called red dwarfs. These are the most common types of stars in the galaxy. About three quarters of the stars in the galaxy are M dwarfs, including our nearest, the next star after the sun, Proxima Centauri. K stars are a little bit smaller, typically about half the mass of the sun, and then these are the G stars like our sun, okay? So we've been finding a lot of these habitable planets around uh, the M stars and K stars. It's been a little bit tougher for the G stars because you have to, um, you have to trace the planets further out uh, to periods closer to a year. And Kepler had a limited uh, lifetime for detecting planets passing in front of the star. So this is, this is not indicating that there's fewer planets around the G stars. It's simply that the, our current techniques are more sensitive to the very close-in planets around these lower mass stars. Um, this was one of my favorites. This was in, uh, one of the first directly imaged uh, uh, planets called Fomalhaut B. This is a bright uh, nearby southern star. It's Alpha Pisces Austrina, in the, uh, the southern fish. This is the brightest star in that constellation. It has a big disk of material about it, uh, around it. I was telling you about the IRAS mission in the early 80s. This is one of the first big infrared excesses d detected with that satellite. There's a lot of dust in that system. And uh, back in 2009, uh, uh, Paul Callis and, and colleagues were looking at images of, of Fomalhaut with the coronagraph in place. So they're blotting out the bright star here. Fomalhaut's you know, in, probably in the top 10 or 20 brightest stars on the sky. They had to blot out the light with Hubble and see all the faint structure. And lo and behold, there was a little dot moving. And this appears to be a planet orbiting the star. What's weird about this thing is that the colors of it look like reflected light from the star. So what we may be seeing here is not a Jupiter, or maybe even not even a Neptune. We may be seeing reflected light from uh, icy particles, something like Saturn's rings, or a cloud of material um, uh, orbiting the star. So the nature of this, this object's a little bit nebulous, but it's been, it's been very interesting. But we could be seeing a tiny planet with a, with a ring system around it. So speaking of rings, I want to tell you about uh, 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 one of the projects I've worked on recently. This is a uh, object, I won't give you the full phone number because it's horrible. This has one of those horrible astronomical names with about 15 digits in it. We've just been, we shortened it to J1407. This was a nearby young star a few hundred light years away. It's similar to the sun, but it's only about 15 million years old, very young star. And we were looking through data from a robotic telescope that was monitoring the brightnesses of thousands of stars looking for planets. And when we were looking through the data, one of the young stars that we were studying back in 2007, so this is time, this is April and May of 2007, and this is the brightness of the star, okay? One is its average brightness over a few year period. 
And the star rotates really rapidly every three days, and it has star spots. And so in the course of a day, it'll go do 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 you know, It'll vary by about 2 or 3%. And then all of a sudden, in April and May, over about uh, 2007, the star started behaving very badly. Okay? We started seeing dimming at the tens of percent level. Okay? That should, that should uh, scream that there's something very interesting going on. You just don't see stars turn off. Okay? At its dimmest point, the star had dimmed 95%. Okay, this really got our attention. The shape of the variations was even more interesting because it looked like you had to be passing some structure in front of the star that might be symmetric. So we first saw this in December 2010 um, at, at University of Rochester. My graduate student, Mark Picot, and I, I remember in December 2010 looking at this plot, trying to figure out what the heck to make of it. And um, the first thing that came to mind was how the rings of Uranus were discovered. So Uranus has these very faint rings around it. Uh, the Kuiper Airborne Observatory was used in 1977 to observe Uranus, and Uranus passed in front of a star, and the star blinked off, and they detected the rings of Uranus. And I thought, could this be like that? But these rings would have to be absolutely huge, very massive. The bottom is just a zoom in of some of the structure. Each little clump of points here is one night of data. Okay, this is a real telescope, a real robotic telescope from the ground. So you have to worry about things like clouds and power outages and things like that. And so there's lots of gaps in the data. Okay, we only have data covering about 20% of the time here. But even during the, after the gaps, you'll see the star has still dimmed tens of percent. Okay, so we tried to piece together the story of this star. And you'll notice, by the way, if you look at it, there's sort of this big inner dip over a couple weeks. And then you'll see these, these little dips on the side. And even in the course of a night, the variation, it, it can vary by tens of percent. This is a really bizarre object. It took us about a year to, to analyze this and come out with a paper that even had a plausible first attempt at what we thought this thing was. This is not that first attempt. This is about our third attempt, OK? This is a movie from about 2015. This is, this is the time. Uh, this is the brightness of the star. The orange line is a model trying to fit those yellow data points. The yellow data are the actual measurements of the star's brightness. It's not perfect, OK? It does a reasonable job. It probably fits about 90% of the data. And at top, this is our model of a huge ring system around a companion we call J1407 little b, OK? We're not sure exactly what this is. It's probably a giant planet. It could be a failed star called a brown dwarf. We'll talk a little bit about those later. Um, right now, we think it's probably less than tens of times the mass of Jupiter. The whole system, this whole system of rings, you could fit well inside the, the orbit of Mercury, okay? But it's much bigger than Saturn's rings, okay? Uh, the whole system is about 200 times bigger than Saturn's rings. This is a totally different beast. This is not like Saturn's systems. Saturn has a, a ring system, covers a few hundred thousand kilometers, very icy particles, and they exist in a region where the, the tidal forces of Saturn would shred the material apart in case it tried to form a moon. I mean, we'll say no big moons here, okay? Gravity will tear these objects apart. This system is about 200 times larger. And so what we think we might be seeing is the material that would go into forming a, a system of moons around a giant planet or little planets around a brown dwarf. I don't even know what, there's no word yet for, I guess, satellite. You would say a satellite around a brown dwarf. The other interesting thing is we see these gaps. We've seen disks before. We see disks around young stars. They can be huge, tens of, t tens of times the Earth's sun distance. We, we don't see too much structure in them. There's a lot of structure in this. To explain these dips, these big variations at the tens of percent level, there has to be gaps in the disk. Well, if there's gaps, why, are, why is there dust preferentially in some lanes and not in other lanes? Okay? So especially this one, this one really stood out. We put ring gap. We could be seeing moon formation. This could be the first um, indirect evidence of exomoons orbiting exoplanets orbiting other stars. We haven't seen any moons yet. All we've got is this disk. But something has got to be clearing out these, these lanes in this disk. Um, we've gone looking for more objects like this. We keep finding, uh, we've we found a few disks. We have, an, we have a system uh, that will be coming out next year um, that is somewhat analogous, but we haven't found one whose structure is as rich as this system. Uh, by the way, uh, so my, my co-author, uh, Matt Kenworthy at University of Leiden, had this cheeky graphic he came up with. If you replaced Saturn in our system with this set of rings, this is what it would look like during the day. <laughs> it would be picking off about 1% of the star's light. It would be like a huge mirror. There's the moon. So how would you like to come out during the day and see that thing? 
Um, it was a slow news day in January 2015. 2015 was such a nice year compared to 2016. Um, and so for a few hours on CNN, uh, this was not fake news. This was real news. Um, this beautiful graphic was done by Ron Miller at Black Hat Studios. He's done a lot of space art, and I wanted to uh, mention that, but uh, he had this beautiful artwork that went with it. I'm doing an experiment with a, a student at University of Rochester to build a robotic observatory. He's building it. I'm here. Hi, Sam. Um, we're hoping to build this experiment to put in Australia in 2017, and we want to watch uh, a nearby exoplanet called Beta Pictoris b. I showed you that uh, disk system. There's a little planet they discovered in 2009, and this is a movie of the images of that planet over the last, over about 2013 to 2015, and as you see, it's going to come very close to its star in 2017. It's not going to pass exactly in front of it, but it's going to come pretty close. So we want to probe the region near the planet to see if there's any evidence of a moon-forming disk like J1407. This system's only a little bit older than J1407. We're talking about 20 million years. So we could be, if, if we're lucky, we may catch a snapshot of a, a disk passing in front of a star um, and maybe see if we can catch moon formation in action. So I now work at JPL. Um, I'm now working with the NASA Exoplanet Exploration Program. Um, its purpose is dis uh, described in the 2014 NASA Science Plan. We're here to discover planets around other stars, characterize their properties, identify candidates that could harbor life. Um, so we're supporting uh, various space missions and, and, and some ground-based efforts to uh, uh, at, at, at achieving, uh, uh, discovering planets and, and characterizing them. This is just a little snapshot of some of the activities that, that the Exoplanet Exploration Program does. Um, a few of the missions here that are, that are uh, managed are, are the Kepler and now K2 mission. Kepler is, this, is the mission that's finding all these transiting planets. Um, it has transitioned now. A couple of the, the, uh, the, the, the gyros are dead. Uh, they're in a phase now where they can only observe certain parts of the sky, and they now call this the K2 mission, but it's still finding many dozens of planets. Um, this is the WFIRST mission I'll talk a little bit about here in a few minutes. Um, there's star development of a star shade. I'll show you an animation of the star shade, and then there's lots of other activities, including some uh, uh, efforts to uh, characterize disks around nearby stars and measure their radial velocities in support of these missions. Uh, let me click on this. And fortunately, the sound is off. I want to thank Dan Fabricki at University of Chicago. This is the classic Kepler orrery. This, these are the multi-planet systems that Kepler found. Every one of these is a solar system. And this is only showing the planets that we can see that happen to be along the line of sight. Okay? Um, they're sorted by size. So you get some things that are probably Jupiter size here, all the way down to very tiny things uh, approaching maybe half the, uh, the size of the Earth. Um, some of these are three, four, five planet systems, and there's a lot of these. And we can now start to measure masses because these, these, these planets are, are tugging on each other. I think it was supposed to zoom in. There we go. Um, and they're sorted by the size of the, uh, the, size of the orbits. Okay? But it's amazing. And these are very close in systems. So pretty much none of these are like our solar system. These are the systems that have planets very, very close to their star. Most of these planets are cl closer to the star than Mercury and Venus. Okay, so that's dizzying. Turn away if, if it's hurting your eyes. So the Kepler mission was launched in 2009. This has been a phenomenal, phenomenally successful mission. Again, it's, it's in this so-called K2 phase now where it's, um, it's using a limited amount of fuel to look at different fields along the ecliptic, along the path where the, the Earth um, uh, in the, the, this, the Earth's orbital plane. And uh, also, very soon, the test mission uh, being developed at, at Goddard Space Flight Center. It's going to be similar to Kepler, but it's going to look, um, it's going to image the whole sky. Kepler basically looked at one region of the sky and stared at 100,000 stars and discovered uh, about 5,000 candidates, and we have about 2,000 of those that are, that are confirmed uh, planets. So from the Kepler and K2 mission, this is showing the, the, the sizes of the planets that have been discovered along with the temperature of the host star. Our sun is around 5,800 Kelvin here. So these are the yellow stars. These are the orange stars. These are the red stars. We're starting to find a lot of planets now that are similar in size to the, the Earth. Okay? So the Earth's size is a 1 on here. Uranus and Neptune are around 4 on here. And you'll notice a lot of these things are intermediate in size between, between the Earth and Uranus and Neptune. This is one of the interesting results from Kepler, is most of the planets we're finding does not have, there's no counterpart in our solar system. There's planets intermediate in size between Earth and Venus and Uranus and Neptune, and they seem to be very, very common. Um, 
This, is, this was a plot from 2015 showing the distribution of planets. These are the big Jupiter-like planets. Here's the Neptune-sized planets, two to six Earth radii. These are so-called super-Earths, 1.25 to two Earth radii. These definitions you'll see vary a little bit over, over time. And these are Earth-sized and smaller, okay? Now, this could be a little bit biased because these smaller planets are harder to pick out. They, have, they cover a smaller area. If you debias this plot, if you take into account that it's harder to find the smaller planets, you start to get a distribution like this. And we still have this excess. There's lots of little so-called mini-Neptunes and super-Earths, for lack of better terms here, and we're seeing a lot of Earths also compared to the number of, of, of uh, these uh, uh, gas giants and things intermediate between the size of <coughs> Neptune and, uh, and Jupiter. Um, it, coincidentally, the, the, the hypothesized Planet 9 you may have heard, of, heard about that they're looking for the, the dynamical estimates, if it's real, are something on the order of five to 10 Earth masses. And so that would actually be intermediate in size between Earth and Neptune. And so if there is a planet nine, it could be part of this, this class of planets that so far we have not seen up close in our solar system. But they're very, very common around nearby stars. Um, this is a recent plot that was uh, 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 put together on showing the masses and the radii of these exoplanets, and I've plotted Earth on here, one Earth mass, one Earth radius. Here's Neptune, 17 Earth masses, four Earth radii. And here's a lot of these things that are intermediate between Earth and Neptune. We're seeing a lot of the so-called super-Earths and mini-Neptunes. These are gas giants up here, okay? So Jupiter, if you could plot on here, Jupiter is about 300 uh, Earth masses and about 10 or 11 uh, Earth radii. So um, Jupiter's up here, Neptune, Earth. So we're finding a lot of these things that are, in inter that are intermediate. These lines are showing, what if you made a planet out of pure iron? Okay, astrophysically, we don't think that's gonna exist at least far out, maybe close in. We might get things similar to that. Things that are dominated by rock, things that are dominated by ice. And when we mean ice, we mean the astrophysical ices, things like water, um, uh, ammonia, methane. And if you get bigger than this line, you have to start adding hydrogen and helium. Okay, so Uranus and Neptune are good examples of that. Uranus and Neptune have sort of a sprinkling of hydrogen and helium, but they're probably mostly dominated by ice and rock. Um, Earth has a big iron nickel core and a big silicate um, uh, mantle and, and crust and just a little thin veneer of water that c covers most of, the, most of the planet. But we're finding a lot of these things uh, intermediate in size, and you'll notice you start running out of the rocky planets, once you get up to about 10 Earth radii, they all start getting big, okay? And for the big fluffy planets, you start losing these big, large radii planets right around two Earth radii. These things could be considered gas dwarfs. They're things not that much bigger than Earth that are dominated by gas, but you may also get things about 10 times the mass of the Earth that are mostly rock, okay? So this intermediate region is very interesting. We're seeing a huge variety of the densities of these planets, and that's gonna translate into a huge variety in the, their compositions. This is the W first mission. This is, this is a, 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 a project uh, being formulated now. There's, there's a work on developing a chronograph for this instrument here. The chronograph is the instrument for, for blotting out the, the lights of stars. This was a very interesting mission concept that the, um, the so-called uh, the uh, 2020, uh, 2010 dec Astronomical Decadal Survey came up with. The astronomical community comes together about every decade and, and um, um, comes up with recommendations on missions. And this was a very interesting case because it can study extrasolar planets, dark energy, and dark matter. So it satisfies the people that study galaxies and cosmology, and it studies the people that, that study planets. And it's actually formulated to work on planets in two different regimes. It's gonna have a coronagraph for blotting out the light of nearby stars, and it's also gonna image the, near the galactic center and look at many thousands and thousands of stars to look for microlensing candidates. The little, the, in case a star with a planet passes in front, it'll see an enhancement in brightness. So what that project is gonna do, this is, this is showing the orbital separation, semi-major axis, and astronomical units. So the Earth is one, here's the Earth. Um, and this is the planet mass and Earth masses. Now Kepler, Kepler in this shaded region, these are, the, these are the planets that pass in front of the star. So you're very sensitive to the planets that are very close to the star, but you tend not to find the ones that are farther away just because geometrically it's, it's much more rare to see the, the, the distant planets line up. So W first is gonna help us sample the outer region. This is the realm of the Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune type planets, and even things down to Earth size and smaller. So we're gonna get a statistical survey of this region, this sort of one to 10 astronomical unit region um, uh, using W first. This is an interesting plot, and I, I apologize because um, 
this one's going to get a little messy, but this is showing the distribution of masses of objects. We've got stars over here, and this is their density. How many per cubic parsec? Parsecs are astronomers' uh, ruler. It's about three and a quarter light years. So it's basically a number of stars per density, okay? So this is um, uh, one solar mass. There's the sun. And this is not fitting all the data we have, but the, the distribution of stars, it, it increases as you get the lower masses and then it decreases. And recently we've been finding things floating around in space that are very low mass. This is 10 to the minus three sun masses. That is roughly a Jupiter, okay? So things the size of our sun are here, things the size of Jupiter are here. Okay, so here's the stars. Okay, we've been studying stars for a long time. This is the mass function of the stars. It peaks around a couple tenths of the solar mass. We have tons of these little dim red dwarfs in the solar neighborhood. The, the mechanism for forming stars for collapsing gas in the interstellar medium seems to prefer forming red dwarfs. Our sun is actually kind of a massive star. It's a, at one solar mass. And you tend not to see things bigger than about 150 times the mass of the sun. Those are very, very massive, short-lived stars. As you go below about a tenth of the solar mass, you get so-called brown dwarfs. Okay? There's a limit below which the hydrogen in the core can't fuse. The temperatures are too low, and these things aren't really stars. They're kind of the failed stars, okay? So the last 20 years, we've been finding more and more of these failed stars, but there's been a surprise, okay? So this is from about a tenth of the solar mass down to about a hundredth of the solar mass. This is about 10 Jupiters. Recently, we've been starting to see very, very low mass things in the field, and now we're starting to put some estimates on their density. By the way, sorry, there's the hydrogen burning limit. Now, when I squint, this is a paper that just came out by Jonathan Gagne, I'm co-author on. If I squint and I look at this, you could just about fit a line through here. I wouldn't place any bets on it. The line I've picked is actually the mass function for planets, orbiting stars. Okay? It goes roughly as the mass to the minus one power. You have many fewer massive planets than you do low mass planets. If you fit that function through here, these could be planets that are floating in space that are not orbiting a star. These could be the so-called rogue planets. And I think I'm starting to see data from a few different surveys now that I think there's, that there's, a, there's a convincing case to be made that there's a separate population. These things fundamentally form different from stars. The physics of gas and dust on the scales of light years um, and gravity winning out over gas pressure and magnetic field pressure, that forms stars and the brown dwarf population. Okay. But below that, there seems to be this whole different population. And these could be planets that have been stripped from uh, their stars and just roaming in space. So we keep talking about you know, Alpha Centauri as the nearest destination in space. We could very well find things that are on the order of the sizes of Jupiters or Saturns or Neptunes floating. There could be many more targets, just not stars, between us and Alpha Centauri. Um, and these would be dimly glowing in the infrared. So there's our, there's our rogue planet. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be launching in 2019. This is going to be the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, it's going to be uh, studying planets that pass in front of the stars. Some of the missions like Kepler and TESS and K2 are feeding targets into the, the plans for JWST. What we want is nearby bright stars that have planets passing in front of them, and we can measure the spectra of those uh, planets. And so there'll be some interesting extrasolar planetary science coming out of JWST. But beyond JWST, um, what we really want to see is the, is the small pale dots, the pale blue dots next to stars. And so this is one of the concepts that's being worked on, in fact, here at JPL, is a so-called star shade. Okay? The idea of a star shade is you launch a telescope, and then you launch a separate spacecraft. Okay? And the model they have is about 34 meters in size, pretty big. But you can, you can wrap it up inside of a rocket and let it unfurl in space. And this star shade, you would put between what star you wanted to look at and your telescope. And so the star shade would essentially form a little shadow. And you have to keep your spacecraft in that shadow and then look for the dim little planets whose light is not passing through the star shade. Okay? Lots of technical challenges, but there's, there's a path ahead. And, and uh, there's, there's currently proposals now to, to, uh, to construct uh, the star shade. There's actually a demo in one of the buildings here at JPL. So this is what it would look like. This is an earlier concept where the star shade would actually launch with a telescope. Um, one of the proposals on the table now that's, that's being considered is you'd launch the WFIRST spacecraft in the mid-2020s, and then a few years later you would launch a separate star shade mission. And the star shade would move about 80,000 kilometers away from the spacecraft. Right here they show like they're close together. They won't be close together. 
Um, and the star sheet has its own fuel, and so it would sort of park in front of the, a star, W first would look at it or whatever future mission uh, comes up, and you would study the planets, um, uh, uh, the, the uh, faint planets. And basically, if you want to get down to things that are about the size of Earth, this is really the next step you have to take. Right now, we're not, this is, this is going to be a, uh, a ways ahead of, of the, the 2020s. Um, I'll, I'll show a few slides on Proxima Centauri B, because you've probably heard a bit about this in the media. So Proxima Centauri is the nearest star to the sun. It's about four light years away. And it was a, it was a great discovery, uh, middle of last year. Um, and this was a ground-based discovery. Uh, there were some astronomers in Europe that used a ground-based telescope with a spectrograph. And they were measuring the motions of Proxima Centauri very closely. And what they decided to do was observe it night after night after night after night after night for months. Okay, they took a lot of telescope time to do this. It was worth it. Okay, so what they found on the velocity signal of the star was this little 11-day ripple at the one meter per second level. Okay, this is one meter per second. Actually, I'm not allowed to walk over the rug here. Um, one meter per second. This is an Earth-sized planet tugging on a little star about a tenth of the size of our sun. So this is the art for Proxima Centauri b. This is Proxima Centauri, the, the little faint star. It's actually a triple system. Our nearest stellar neighbor is a triple. Okay? Our sun is a little bit of an oddball, is a single star. Lots of stars come in doubles, triples, quadruples, and up. So the art here actually shows this. There's, there's two sun-like stars very far away, about 10,000 astronomical units away from the star. And then here's the little red dwarf star, uh, uh, Proxima Centauri. So these are the designations, Alpha Centauri A, B, and C, and then the so-called proper names. Rigel Centaurus, this, is, this was the foot of the centaur. Proxima Centauri was the nickname for the, the dim red dwarf discovered about 100 years ago. This is just showing a comparison of the size of those stars compared to the sun. Alpha Centauri A is a little bit bigger than the sun. Alpha Centauri B is a little bit smaller than the sun. Proxima Centauri is about a tenth of the size of the sun. And there could be planets around Alpha Centauri A and B, too. Um, there's, there was a... Uh, purported planet a few years ago around Alpha Centauri B. So far, that seems to have uh, not been confirmed. But so far, Proxima Centauri B looks good. This is showing a comparison of the Sun and Mercury's orbit, OK, our innermost planet, along with, on this side, Proxima Centauri, dim little red dwarf. If you can see, it's, its luminosity is very tiny. It's about 0. 0.0015 times the energy that the Sun is putting out. This is the habitable zone for Proxima Centauri. And lo and behold, Proxima Centauri b, it orbits its star in 11 days. But this star is so dim that if you want to look for a place that has liquid water, you have to move this close to the star. Okay, You're camping real close to the fire to keep that water liquid. Now, we don't know. Um, this, this planet is probably a rocky planet based on its mass. Um, we don't have an estimate of the radii. We, don't have an estimate of the, we, don't, we haven't seen the atmosphere or anything yet. So right now, there's a bit of speculation on that. Um, by the way, so, so eventually these planets will need names. Eventually your kids and your grandkids and beyond, these, these, some of these objects are going to be so interesting that they may have their own proper names. You think of the, the planets in our own solar system. So this is the first attempt the, the International Astronomical Union did last year. There was a contest opened up to the public called um, uh, the Name Exoworlds Contest. And so there was a few dozen of these exoplanets were actually named, and you saw a few of those in the talk. And so some of these are like, there's a very nice example here, the Mu Auri system is known as Cervantes, Quixote, Dulcinea, Rocinante, Sancho. So some of them have some interesting themes based on characters from books. Um, the contest was, there was entries from all over the world. You had to be in an astronomical organization to apply. So, but there was classrooms and astron uh, amateur astronomy clubs that contributed. And uh, so there was, a, there was a lot of great uh, uh, entries. And so these are the ones that won out. There was 600,000 votes from all over the world for these. So this, this was, a, this was a, the first attempt of the IAU at this, but, but I suspect we'll be doing more of this in the future. Um, I just wanted to, to look back at Earth. There's this great picture of the Voyagers took, uh, uh, Voyager 1 took in 1991. This was the Earth uh, as seen from tens of astronomical units away from the, the, uh, the, the sun. Um, oops. Oh, it didn't show the other one. OK, I have another one. There was a picture that was just taken this week from Mars. Uh, from one of the Mars orbiters, it shows the Earth and the Moon as seen from Mars. Um, but uh, at, the, at the end of the day, we'd like to also understand the, the Earth in the context of the other planets. We only have one Earth. We can't run the experiment of, of forming the Earth. And um, we probably shouldn't be tweaking too much with the chemistry of the atmosphere and the oceans. Just a suggestion. I like the Earth the way it is. Um, but we get to see all the different examples of, of, of how physics and chemistry comes together to form other planets. So this is sort of a, it's January. This is the State of the Galaxy report. 
Um, this is, I'm gonna give you a few example, a few results. These are basically extrapolating from what we know now, okay? We don't have a complete census of all these objects. Um, this is just from what we've been able to gather from, from some of these systems. First off, exoplanets are ubiquitous, okay? Nearly every star you see in the night sky has planets. This is amazing, okay? This is one of the terms that was in the so-called Drake equation. How common are planets? We now know planets are very, very common. Um, sun-like planets, uh, so, sorry, sun-like stars typically have five or more planets. There could be even more. This is only down to the size of about half an Earth, okay? So most of those stars not only have planets, they probably have several planets. Um, the super-Earths and mini-Neptunes, these things sort of intermediate between the size of the Earth and Neptune, they seem to be more common than the rocky planets. Um, they especially seem to be common around the very, uh, around the very lowest mass stars. Um, that may be a hint why the aliens haven't got here yet, all right? So there's, the planets, if there's a lot of these planets that have these big gaseous envelopes, they may not be conducive of, for, for forming life. But uh, anyway, so those, those, those intermediate-sized planets seem to be very common. Planets form over a wide range of stellar properties. It seems like everywhere we go in parameter space is a function of stellar mass, luminosity, age. We see, star, we see planets around very youngest stars. The oldest planetary system we've seen so far is 11 billion years old. Okay, the universe is 13 billion years old. This is one of the early... Um, uh, We've seen a system with a full set of planets that, that formed less than two billion years after the Big Bang. We see the planets as a variety uh, varying by chemical composition around the very metal rich stars and around the very metal poor stars. We're starting to see some trends, like the planets that the, the stars that have more metals seem to form more Jupiters. So that might be telling us something about the, the conditions for forming planets. And also the multiplicity of the star. We see planets around one star systems, two star systems, triples, quadruples. So the, the, the planets are very resilient. The incidence of the exo-Earths, this is still being worked on. If we call the so-called exo-Earths rocky planets, rock-dominated planets between about half the size of the Earth and 1.5 times the size of the Earth, I picked that upper limit because much, uh, if you go bigger than that, it looks like the planets start to get very thick uh, gas, uh, gaseous envelopes and they become less Earth-like. If you go much below about Earth uh, uh, mass uh, in size, you start to have um, the lower gravity starts to, uh, you start to lose atmosphere. It'll turn into something more like Mars. So we're sort of looking at things within about half the, the size of the Earth in size and orbiting in their habitable zone. So how many are they there? This is still being debated. There's, there's still, uh, uh, people are still taking the data and uh, trying to statistically combine it. And the answers are coming up over, a, a, there's a bit of a range here by about a factor of 10 or so. But the answer is probably something like a half, okay? There's probably about half a planet per sun-like star where you've got a rocky planet. That's not to say that's the incidence of planets with life. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with those planets. They may have the right size, they may be in the right place, but there may be, there may be other conditions um, that uh, preclude life on them. I want to show this plot I, I had made several years ago and I just updated it late last fall. This is kind of the Moore's Law for, for planets. Um, this is showing the year, going back to 1989, and this is the number of planets, but it's logarithmic. It goes from 1, 10, 100, 1,000. And the remarkable thing is, over the last three decades, this doubling time hasn't varied that much. About every 27 months, the number of exoplanets doubles. And actually, if you look at the missions that are coming ahead, we'll probably be discovering tens of thousands of planets with those missions, and this trend looks like it'll continue at least, at least well through the, the, the 2020s. So there is a, a characteristic doubling time scale. Um, the interesting thing is once you start finding these, now you're going to start finding planets that are more and more similar to Earth. You're starting to find things that are within a small parameter range of the characteristics of Earth, and hopefully we'll be able to get spectra of those. So um, I'm going to put this slide up. This is the, uh, these are a few links to the exoplanet program, exoplanets.nasa.gov. We have the NASA exoplanet archive uh, down at the, the Caltech uh, campus at the so-called Nexi Institute. Um, I just, this is a shout out to the Kepler and K2 exoplanet mission. They have a lot of great graphics from that mission. And I'm going to show a little example for a minute or two here of the so-called NASA Eyes app. This is an app you can download that lets you fly around the galaxy and visit the exoplanets. So I'll, I'm going to switch the screen to Eyes on, whoops, Eyes on exoplanets. And I have to move my computer without destroying it. And now we're gonna fly around the galaxy. So this is, this is the NASA's Eyes uh, app, and you can rotate around the galaxy. So these highlighted stars all have exoplanets. The sun is at the center of this distribution, and you see this big plume of objects out here. That's the Kepler field. The Kepler mission stared at 100 square degrees of sky for a few years and discovered thousands of planets in one direction. 
So all those results I showed you from that mission, it was just from that tiny patch of sky in the constellation Cygnus and Lyra, okay? The test mission is gonna map the whole sky um, and, and there'll be thousands more exoplanets to be found. And I wanted to show, um, this, this has a little animation. This will fly us to Proxima Centauri in the nearest uh, exoplanetary system. So if you look hard enough, you'll see the sun flying by. We're zooming in to Proxima Centauri, the star, and then this is the little planet that was discovered in 2016. And we can, you can sort of change the orientation. It tells you about the planet, tells you the mass of the, the, uh, the, the star, how many planets are in this system, um, and you can get, get information about these. And so there's a nice app here. You can go visit the planetary systems. Um, and with that, I'll uh, thank you very much for your time, and I'll open up the questions. So there's a microphone in the center of the room. Um, so I ask if you, if you ask a question, please use the microphone. Can I go? Yep. Hi, uh, great presentation, thank you. Uh, I had a question about hot Jupiters. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how it's possible that they form uh, around sun-like planets. That's a very good question. So as soon as they were discovered about 20 years ago, uh, the theorists went to work trying to explain how they form. Um, there's a couple different ideas. Um, one, of the, one of the, I would say the idea that probably has the most merit is that there, there are Jupiters that, far, that form far out, just like our Jupiter did, um, but they were able to, they had gravitational interaction with their, their, their inner disk. There was a torque between the disk and the planet and the planet can actually slowly change its, um, uh, change its trajectory. Um, but there's a, you can tweak the initial conditions on these, on these experiments, and you may get a Jupiter that travels all the way in and runs into the star. You may get ones that move in and then stop. You may get ones that don't move at all. And so there seems to be a, a, a range of, of stopping points. It's possible that our Jupiter moved in, cleared out. There, there really isn't that much matter in the inner part of our solar system compared to Jupiter. Um, in fact, Jupiter's existence itself may be why there's so little mass in, in the inner planets. Um, there's a model called the Grand Tack, where, the, where Jupiter and Saturn and the other planets, the outer planets were migrating a little bit, and Jupiter may have swept out some of the region near us. Um, it's, it's conceivable the, plan, the planets could have formed in situ. Um, it's a little hard to believe because we think that the, if you have ice, ice sticks together a lot better than rock, especially hot rock. And um, so the conditions for these, these planets accreting out of that disk, it, it, it can go much, much faster if you have a lot of ice. And so you need to be a couple times further than your sun distance where water becomes an ice and carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. These things are very good at forming uh, ices that, that, that stick together. So, but there's been some planets where they think they may have a, they may have a, rocky, a large rocky core. You may need tens of Earth masses to form these along with a hydrogen helium rich envelope. So we may be seeing, there may be a variety of, of mechanisms. The other hint is some of the hot Jupiter systems have stellar companions. Those stellar companions could have altered the orbits of those Jupiters. And if they were sent in on sort of comet-like orbits, the, the, the torques from the star itself would actually circularize them and, and uh, bring them closer to the star. So there, there may be a few different physical mechanisms. Thank you. Yep. There's probably a really good reason for this, but why does the, the sun shade or the star shade have to be so big and far away rather than smaller and just closer to the lens? Um, I think the answer is the, so the, you need the, the position of the star shade with respect to the spacecraft, you need to get within a couple meters, right? It has to be very, very, basically about as, much wiggle room as I have on this rug up here, okay? And this is one of the technical challenges, is keeping the orientation of the, the, the star shade in the spacecraft um, uh, so close. To be big enough to create a shadow. Yeah, you, have to, you want the spacecraft to be in the shadow uh, that, the, that the star shade is, is, um, uh, is creating. So it's, it's, it's not purely the geometric size. There's some, there's some other optical uh, uh, complications that you have to take into account. But the, 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 the model they're working with now, we're talking tens of meters in size. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Then as a follow-up question to that, is, is the star shade, uh, is it the same idea as a coronagraph? Is it the same thing? And, and as kind of a follow-up to that, is it how much 
how much, how well does it blot out the light? How, like, uh, what planets, how far would those planets be away from the star that, such that we could see them? That's a great question. So the, the, I, if I had some more time, I would have talked a bit more about the chronographs. So the chronographs are essentially little miniature star shades you have inside of your telescope. Um, you, can, you can blot out the star within, uh, within your telescope, um, and you have to, uh, you have to create, uh, you have to make them in certain shapes that have to be very precisely uh, machined. Um, how dark can they get? I think the answer for the, for the internal chronograph in W first, I think now it's 10 to the minus nine. Yeah, so something like something on the order of, of a part in a billion. Um, so uh, you're getting down to seeing things like Jupiter around the nearby stars. The other thing to consider is the so-called inner working angle. And so for the setups that we're talking about, for the, for the telescopes that we're talking about, um, the inner working angle is on the order of a tenth of an arc second. So something like one over few ten thousandths of a degree. Um, and so if you want to see, uh, you know, planets like Jupiter, Neptune, et cetera, you'd have to look around just the nearby stars. If you move the star too far away, that angular separation gets too small. Okay. And then follow-up to that is, does the star shade, would that move so that you could look at multiple stars? Yes. Yeah, I think people would scream if it only looked at one star. <laughs> you think so? um, the idea is the star shade, so you would launch your telescope. Your telescope would uh, observe the star for days or weeks on end, but you need to integrate all that signal to get the, the faint light from the planets. And then the star shade would has some fuel, and it would move to its next orientation, and it may take days or weeks to get to that next orientation. In the meantime, you have a, a, a space telescope which can do other things, can look for microlensing events or study dark energy and galactic structure. There's lots of other astrophysics you can do in the, in the, the, the downtime. Not really downtime, but <laughs> in between observing the exo-Earths. Okay. One more question. Uh, so with respect to circumbinary uh, or uh, stars, um, it, have we found any planets that order that orbit within uh, the boundary of two of, of a binary system, or are they that's, all on the outside? That's Alpha Centauri is a perfect example. That is a that's an Earth-sized planet orbiting a little red dwarf. If you go 10,000 astronomical units away, you've got two Sun-like stars orbiting each other. Alpha Centauri A and B go around each other about every 80 years, and they themselves there's 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 the there's uh, dynamically stable zones around each of those um, about the size of Mars's orbit where there could be planets. So all three bodies could have planets. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Looks like we have uh, some, whoops, sorry, we have some questions from the, the internet. Uh, it is known what the effect of dark matter is on gravitational lensing, if any. Okay. So when we're talking about dark matter, um, the dark matter seems to be distributed on very large scales. We're talking thousands of light year scales. The, the dark matter is probably everywhere, but it's at very, very low density, and particle physicists have not been able to detect it yet. But we don't think it's having an influence on the scale of uh, planetary systems on, on those scales. Where we really need to worry about dark matter, if you will, is on the scales of galaxies and galaxy clusters. And that's where it seems like we're missing, um, we're, we're missing much of the, the matter in the universe. Um, the next question is, how can information be discerned about any one planet using the wobble method when, th when there are likely multiple planets causing their star to wobble? That's a great question. Um, you need to watch them for a long time. If you were watching our solar, if you're watching our sun, if you're an astronomer who was tens of light years away and you're watching our sun, Jupiter is tugging on our sun. Jupiter has a 12-year period. Saturn's a pretty big planet. It has a 30-year period, so it's tugging on the sun. And then the Earth and the Venus, uh, Earth, uh, Earth and Venus are both tugging on the sun. And so you actually get a fairly complicated pattern, and you, you need to monitor them over many years. Okay? And this is um, you know, teasing out the, 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 the signals over very long time scales. This is, this is technically challenging. Um, we're used to thinking of these missions in terms of years, but we may need to, um, you know, to, to, to properly characterize the masses of the, the planets further out. We may need missions that last decades. So. Um, you, need to do, you need to do computer modeling and, and try different uh, solutions until you get one that statistically looks right. Yes? Yeah, I just wanted to say that if, if you go to that top uh, link, the website exoplanets.nasa.gov, there's a lot of good things to read there and some good videos that will help you understand the coronagraph and the starshade and what the strengths and, and difficulties are for each. Yes, 
barely scratched the surface with with graphics for the for the chronograph and the uh, uh, and the uh, the star shade. So I definitely encourage you to to, uh, to go to exoplanets.nasa.gov. Any other questions? Um, my question is, how will we know when we found a planet that may have life on it? What are you looking for? That is a great question. <laughs> and it's a whole talk in itself. There's a, the, a, the so-called biosignatures. I mean, we're, we're, we're obviously looking for planets similar to Earth um, that would have you know, features like oxygen, um, you know, some CO2, maybe see methane. Um, there's, there's a lot of discussion now, what would be, what are the unique chemical signatures that you would see in a spectrum? Because what we're finding is there may be abiotic uh, reasons for having oxygen-rich atmospheres that may not require, uh, uh, you know, photosynthesis. Um, so right now people are, people are studying how do you, um, what, what chemical signatures do you look for that are, that are unique? Um, you look for chemicals uh, that are out of equilibrium. So if you start seeing oxygen, CO2, methane in certain abundances, you might ask, well, why is there so much methane there? Oh, there's cows there, right? Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, if we look at a uh, uh, planet like Mars, you see CO2, and Venus, you see CO2. You, can, you would know that there's uh, a very strong greenhouse effect in Venus's atmosphere from the, the, the depths of the, the carbon dioxide feature. Um, we have some CO2, a little bit, just enough to uh, warm up the planet uh, uh, on the order of 14 Celsius. Um, you know, there's, there's different things you'll be able to tell from the, the chemical signatures. So that was a, that's a whole talk in itself. Um, and we've, the, some of the larger planets, some of the larger transiting planets, people may be able to tease out the, um, uh, the, 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 the chemistry and see evidence of, of, uh, of certain molecules. A few of the directly imaged planets, the giant planets, um, they're also seeing things like methane um, and hydrogen in the atmospheres. Um, in addition to the sort of the, the unusual mass planets that we don't really see based on the solar system model that we have, have we seen any super dynamic systems where there's multiple orbital planes? So you have one planet over here, you know, several on one one angle, you know, in very eccentric comet light orbits, or is it all very sort of conventional what we uh, see? So here? that's that's been one of the other surprises. We look at our own solar system, the planet orbits tend to be fairly circular. There's a few exceptions. You know, Mercury's is a little eccentric. Um, but most of the planets, like Earth's, uh, Earth's orbit is circular to about 2%. Most of the planets in the solar system, their orbits are circular to about 5%. Um, a lot of the systems we're seeing the, a lot of the ones that Kepler is seeing that are very close in tend to be very circular, but there are ones on very eccentric orbits. A lot of the Doppler spectroscopy detected systems, some of them are on very eccentric orbits. They've seen Jupiter-like planets on comet-like orbits. Um, they've also detected uh, planets orbiting very close to their star going the opposite way of the star's rotation. Ah. How do you do that? <laughs> you know, it's, they've had to, you know, that's, that's a whole can of worms in terms of dynamical simulations. You must have had a very complex, there must have been multiple planets, some collisions. You know, how do you, how do you, how do you get a system where um, it, uh, the, the, the one of the planets is going the wrong way? Um, and at a very steep angle with respect to its star. So um, they're not all nice and circular like our, our solar system. And that's actually an open question is just how... Um, how unique is our solar system in terms of the, uh, the, the dynamics? Another question with uh, respect to the orbits. Mm -hmm. I guess for us to be able to detect the planets, they have to cross the line between us and their sun. Yep. And so how much of a coincidence is uh, that, that there are orbits um, that have that property, and how often are they completely misaligned such that they never cross that line? Well, so most of them are not passing in front of the star. So we have to be, you know, we're with missions like Kepler, literally looking at over 100,000 stars, and we're only seeing a few thousand where the planets are passing in front of the star. So statistically, you have to take into account that it's less likely that you would see the planets pass in front of the star as you get further away. There's just a lot more. If you start varying the, 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 the orientations of the orbits, you know, 99 point. 99% of the time, you're not going to see it uh, passing in front of the star. So this is one of the reasons the Kepler mission has been so sensitive to the, the planets that are very close in. Um, so 
it's, you know, those, are, those are the ones we can see. What we're doing is we're, based, based off of those statistics, we're trying to figure out what the distribution looks like for all the planets, um, um, uh, taking into account the ones, that, the ones that we can't see. This is one of the frustrating aspects of the planet detection techniques is they all probe slightly different parameter space. Like the transit method, you're very sensitive to planets very close in, and you get the radii. And occasionally, you can get the mass if the planets are, are tugging on each other. With radial velocity, it's tougher to get the low-mass planets, but you can detect the planets further out. Microlensing, you're very sensitive to bigger or to, to planets at a wide range of masses, but very mostly very far away from their star. Um, they all cover different parameter spaces, and so we're trying to piece together what the the distribution of planetary properties is, building off the strengths of these different uh, techniques. But no no single technique is going to give you the whole answer. Any other questions? Okay, I'll, I'll take one more. Mm -hmm. Hello, I'd like to keep it short. I uh, I just had a question. You vaguely touched on Planet Nine, mm -hmm. and I guess digesting data to see if it really was a planet or just debris. Do you think you'd be able to t give us a heads up on on a timeline, possibly, or <laughs> how it would when we there's would know more people, about it? There's other people down the road to talk to about that. Um, um, I would say what looks interesting is that there's we're finding there's a whole belt of objects out past Neptune's orbit, the so-called Kuiper Belt. Um, over by the past two and a half decades, we've been finding f more and more objects out past Neptune's orbit. Pluto and a few of the dwarf planets just tend to be the biggest ones, Eris, Maki Maki, Haumea. There's, there's thousands of these big objects out there. And as you go f further out, out sort of 40, 50 astronomical units, you're starting to see a little bit of clumping in the orbital properties of some of the very, very distant objects. And it looks a little, it, it's interesting. There's, there's not many of them, but their properties are starting to clump up. Why would they be clumped up? It's almost like there's preferred orbits. Now, what I'm, this is for a very low number of objects. Um, but over time, they've been finding more of these objects very far out, things on orbital timescales of thousands of years. They spend most of their time hundreds to thousands of astronomical units away from the sun. Um, we can only catch them when they're very close, very close, up past Pluto, you know, 40, 50 astronomical units out. Um, that's when they're bright enough that, that we can see them with our, our telescopes. They're very dim. They're very slow moving. Um, and so it's only been the last few years they've been able to piece together a few of these, and they're starting to say, hmm, there's some interesting properties. You know, the, the, the orbits are starting to clump up. Well, what would produce a clumping up of those properties? And so, um, you know, I'm starting, I was skeptical initially. I'm starting to take it a little bit more seriously when there's results from multiple um, teams that are working on the dynamics, they're doing simulations, and they're starting to come to some similar constraints. And so what it, I think the, the the, the hypothesis at this point is you're talking about an object that's probably about 600 astronomical units away from the sun, probably something like five or 10 Earth masses, maybe something intermediate between the Earth and, and Neptune in size. Um, am I 100% sure they're going to find it? No. <laughs> um, we've been burned too many times. But it's, it's, when I see multiple teams doing these simulations and coming to similar um, conclusions and starting to say, it's probably in that region of the sky. You know, when they'll actually show a plot and they'll say, it's probably in this banana-shaped region of the sky, and we think we know the mass and we think we know the radius um, and the orbital period, then I start to take that seriously. The reason it hasn't been discovered yet, if it is real, is because the, 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 the region of the sky where it is is probably is, is very big. And it's, it's probably so faint, even if it's something the size of Neptune and it's 600 times further away than your sun distance, we're talking about something that's about in, in magnitude parlance, 24th, 25th magnitude. This is just many, many factors of 10 dimmer than, than most of the things you're used to looking at with a telescope. So it takes up a lot of telescope time. You need wide field images, and they need to be deep. And that means a lot of time on telescopes, and you have to convince astronomers to give you that time to, to carry out that study. Um, but now that the, there's been multiple teams, uh, um, there's multiple teams searching, and there's multiple teams coming to similar conclusions about where on the sky it might be, I would, not be, I would not be shocked if next week there was an announcement, but it, 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 it could be in a few years. It may disappear. Maybe there's some observational bias we hadn't thought of in the orbital properties of these very distant objects that, that, that may be affecting the, um, um, uh, that may be allowing astronomers just to find ones that have certain properties. But um, I would say my money now is they're probably going to find one, but, uh, and it's probably going to be something smaller than Neptune. Thank you. And when they do, 
we need to build a probe and send it there <laughs> as fast as we can. And along the way, we can take planets of, we can take pictures of exoplanets. So, okay, that may not go over well with some people, but we should definitely build a probe to Planet Nine, uh, send a probe to Planet Nine if it's discovered. Okay, I think, I think we'll close up the, uh, the questions there, and thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the talk.